Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. It's cloud. It's cloud. It's close. It's close. It's close. It's close. Hello and so sabai and welcome to another episode of The Documentary Life. I'm your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. I'm very excited for today's show as we'll be talking about some topics and some geographic locations that are near and dear to my heart. And even more exciting is that we'll be holding these topics of discussion with a very special guest, Documentary Lifer. There will be two main topics of discussion today. One, we're going to delve into what it's like logistically and creatively to work in a developing country, in this case, Cambodia. And secondly, for anyone who has maybe recently started a family and because of this, assumed that your dreams of adventuring and making films in a developing country were no longer a possibility, well, we're going to not only tell you why that's not only untrue, but perhaps why it might even be more advantageous for you to live and work in these environments with your family. Every once in a while, you hear about someone that's doing some similar things in similar places to yourself. No, no, more than, more than similar, I'm talking to the point of practically running parallel lives to your own. But for one reason or another, you never quite get around to meeting this person. Or if you are fortunate enough to meet the person, you aren't quite able to work out the time to sit down and have that proper heart-to-heart -heart conversation about your seemingly parallel lives that you for so long wanted to have. Well, I'm thrilled to say that today with this particular podcast, I was actually able to finally have that conversation with a documentary filmmaker whom I've long admired from afar. I mean, I'd met John a couple of times over the years, but it was always at some kind of event or premiere, and, and we were never able to make the time to have a proper conversation about any number of our film projects that have dealt with the same amazing, sometimes crazy culture, and have all been shot in the same amazing, sometimes crazy country. If you're new to the show, and let's be honest, there's a good chance that you are, since it is the first season, I'll start off by telling you a little about myself and my connection to today's podcast. I've been working in commercial and documentary film since 2004, when I was asked to be a part of a two-person film team and go and live and work in the country of Cambodia for six months. The film was Bomb Hunters, a film that I was also later on hired to edit upon return to the States. This particular year was one that would forever change my life. It opened my eyes up to a part of the world that I have continued to explore ever since, and it introduced me to the genre of documentary filmmaking. Cambodia, in particular, has become a bit of a home away from home for me. Rarely does a year go by where I haven't either visited or produced some sort of film work there. Most recently, my wife Steph and I lived in Cambodia's capital city of Phnom Penh for five months while we worked on our current documentary project, Elvis of Cambodia. We did this with our 10-month-old Flynn, who learned how to walk there and uttered his first words, Utne, which means no in Khmer. That's a little about me. Now I'd like to tell you a little about someone whom I have a great deal of respect and admiration for, and whose work has inspired me greatly. He is a fellow documentary lifer, and his name is John Perosi. John is a New York-based director and cinematographer. He has directed music videos for bands like Queens of the Stone Age, Calexico, and Vic Chestnut, to name a few. He did second unit work as a DP for Matt Dillon's City of Ghosts, one of the first feature films shot in Cambodia. He then went on to produce his own feature documentary, Sleepwalking Through the Mekong, a film that followed LA-based Cambodian rock and roll band Dengue Fever as they made their first excursion back to the lead singer's home country. And most recently, the award-winning feature-length documentary about the history of Cambodian rock and roll, Don't Think I've Forgotten, 
a film that has received rave reviews from just about every publication on the planet. And now, I'm honored to share that conversation that I had with John Perosi. John, soak sabai and welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be talking to you today. Yeah. Again, thanks for taking the time to be a guest here on The Documentary Life. Before we get into some of these topics, I think it's important that we that we get a bit into your background. Um, many of my listeners are are soon to be documentary filmmakers, and I say soon instead of aspiring or even worse wannabe, because I think there's something to I don't know, like instilling a belief in people that 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 they are what they want to be, and that it's something more than a dream. It's 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 an achievable thing, and and I find that it's helpful for them to hear about you know other people's stories, their lives, and and really how they first you know became filmmakers. I mean, this filmmaking thing doesn't it doesn't simply happen happen just overnight. There's a bit of a journey there. So if you wouldn't t- mind taking a minute, John, and, and sort of give us a little bit about a, of your background and some of your journey into becoming a documentary filmmaker. Well, for me, um, the process of became, becoming a filmmaker was sort of a long one. Um, I went to film school here in New York City and got a chance to really, you know, see so many great films back in the day when all the repertory theaters were here and you could see so much. And, um, you know, I was just fascinated by the process and wanted to always wanted to know more about how it, how it works and started working as a PA, started working for free, started working, doing lighting, working as a grip, working as an electrician and just sort of getting behind the camera because obviously for me, the camera was a focal point of, you know, where everything was happening. So where you were trying to get to. Yeah. So, you know, I spent many years working as a grip and, and then started gaffing and, and worked on low budget movies here in New York and started working on a lot of music videos. And, um, and I think a lot of it was whatever was happening in the industry at the time was sort of where I was finding myself. So for example, in the nineties, when the music video thing was so big and yeah, record right. labels were so, you know, spending so much money, I was working on literally hundreds of videos. I was living in Los Angeles, but it gave me the opportunity to sort of experiment with lighting because I was working as a gaffer and a lighting director mainly. So that was a great time for me because mm. music videos afford you that freedom to experiment and um and on a very big scale. By the end we were doing very big videos and and then all of a sudden that that bottom dropped out and the, yeah. the record industry sort of fell apart and um I started shooting documentaries for friends because a lot of friends I knew were just making documentaries and before I knew it that was sort of the groove I was into. And through that I think I really fell in love with the process of, of you know making documentary films and obviously there's a variety of styles in terms of how to make them but um doing it with friends and seeing how it was done sort of led me to just naturally want to make my own I suppose. It did. When did documentary start to really surface for you to a point where you knew that you know what I want <clears throat> to I want to start making some of my own. Well, I think a big part of it for me was always working on things that were music related and they they tended to be things where I had the most fun and maybe things that I was the most interested in personally. Um, so for me coming at documentaries, it was always sort of from a musical music perspective or the, the, the subject matter dealing with music. Yeah. I, I think really the, the going to Cambodia also, I mean, Cambodia was for me an eye opening experience in terms of as a filmmaker, because there's so many great untold stories there and um, the history of the country is so fascinating, and it's so it has such an ancient culture too. It has just so much that the U.S. doesn't have. Of course, the U.S. has its own particular stories to tell, but I was just sort of fascinated by what had happened in Cambodia and how everything, you know, how that all sort of fits together relative to even to to Americans and American history. Well, and that's a very very appropriate segue into where I wanted to go with this was the next, I, I mean, I'm looking at my notes right here as you're speaking, John, I'm like, wow, he apparently I, I forwarded my notes to him because the segue is into Cambodia. My first introduction to Cambodia was in 2004 on, on the feature doc called Bomb Hunters. And Bomb Hunters was a film that explored essentially sort of the rural part of the of the population in Cambodia that was digging up old mortars and bombs and rockets, you know, from the 30 years of civil conflict, the illegal you know, American bombing during the Vietnam War. And they were digging up these these bombs and they were essentially trying to, they were attempting to dismantle them, whether it was through a propane torch or a handsaw. And they were separating the TNT and trying to sell the, the TNT as well as the metal on the scrap metal trade. And, and we were there 
sort of filming that that um, that practice. Wow, that's pretty dramatic material right there. Uh, we, it's <laughs> it's a hell of a way to really start your introduction into a, a part of the world that you would then kind of you know fall in love with and 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 the genre in documentaries that that I would you know also fall in love with I I remember distinctly the day when you know at the time I'm supervising a valet staff at a chain hotel and and uh, and um, a, a colleague of mine um, act, approached me and said hey would you be interested in um, in running sound for me in Cambodia for six months on a documentary film I mean I don't know maybe you've got things going on here man but uh, I don't know if it's something you'd ever be interested in or and of course it took me all of five minutes to answer uh, yes <laughs> yes I'll leave this job and come mm. spend six months in a country I know little to nothing about and 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 hold a boom mic and 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 do that for you yeah, of course how did Cambodia specifically happen for you John it was somewhat of a similar situation. I got a phone call to work on a film that was going to be shot in Cambodia. And, you know, I was working at the time as a camera operator and second unit DP in, in the industry. And um, the film was uh, Matt Dillon's first uh, directorial project called City of Ghosts. And the cinematographer was someone I had worked with a lot in the past. Jim Deneau was a great guy. And um, so, yeah, they, the production called me and said, hey, Jim Deneau gave us your number. We're looking for a camera operator to be in Cambodia for three months to do this Matt Dillon film. So yeah, that was a really out of, out of left field phone call. And I was really intrigued by it because Cambodia was someplace that I actually knew very little about yeah. and had never really thought about even going. But <laughs> I mean, that that's one of the things about doing what we do is when you get those kind of calls and you have the opportunity to travel to places you've never been. Um, I feel really fortunate because I've been to a lot of, you know, a lot of different parts of the world because yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how, I got on a, that's that was that's what led me to the airport to get on a plane going to Cambodia. What was it like working there at the time of City of Ghosts? And I ask that as as someone who works in the film and TV industry, I'd love for I'd love to hear about you know, for you at that time, what were the more obvious differences working in the industry in a place like Cambodia versus where you had just come from years working in New York and LA? Well, certainly there's no place like Los Angeles because Los Angeles, you know, was built around the film industry. So even even New York seemed somewhat like a third world country mm -hmm. compared to L.A. back then. L.A. was, you know, in terms of working, it's it's the city is sort of designed around making films. But um, obviously Cambodia and all it had gone through is sort of the direct opposite of it. Um, I, I It was interesting when we were there in 2001. I... I remember thinking like, wow, this is a really great thing that we're doing only because we're bringing film back, filmmaking back to Cambodia. At the time, I didn't realize they had had a pretty thriving industry before the Khmer Rouge in the 60s and early 70s. Right. But I remember saying to Jim Deneau, the cinematographer, I said, you know, Jim, it's great that this money's being spent here and people are getting, you know, a taste of filmmaking again and we're hiring local people. And Jim said something very telling to me and, and wise, as Jim always does. He said, you know, it'll be great when Cambodians are making their own films oh, again. <laughs> and I thought like, wow, that's not going to be for a while because, you know, 2001, the country was such a rough place yeah. still. But now what's so great is that it is happening and it did just take some time. And there's a whole new young generation of people making music and films and art again. So in a way that didn't, wasn't really happening then. So, um, but in terms of the, the logistical problems of making films there, yeah, it was really, it was really tough because, I mean, they had to bring trucks in from, from Thailand. Thailand, I'm sure. And, yeah. and they had to bring a lot of crew from Thailand. And we had uh, an Israeli production team because they were very uh experienced in making films in third world countries films like rambo and you know they had worked in afghanistan and places like that and they actually had to hire a road crew to travel with us just to be able to get the trucks to certain locations <laughs> because the infrastructure of the country was so poor at that time right i remember when i first saw city of ghosts and it was i'm, I'm sure it was very shortly after being in cambodia working on bomb hunters that first time and any sort of critical analysis in terms of uh, a narrative or a film, all of that aside, um, I absolutely love that film. And, and and a huge a huge part of that is because you know, I mean, as, as someone who has worked in that country, you know that uh, there's no way that Matt Dillon didn't have a huge connection to Cambodia and to the people because just watching that film. It's, it, it, it lives and breathes Cambodia 
in, in many, many ways that no typical Hollywood film certainly could ever do. And I really, yeah. really appreciate that. Yeah, Matt had really spent a lot of time there and was really, you know, curious about the culture and traditional music and popular music. And there are elements that are in the film because of him. I mean, yeah. all the texture of it is really Matt. And then Jim Deneau as the cinematographer helping yeah. him capture it. So those two guys together, you know, it was just a pleasure. You know, it was funny, you know, so I'm about to go to Cambodia for the first time, Asia for the first time, in fact. And I remember emailing Jim saying, hey, Jim, should I bring any of my cameras with me, like my personal cameras? He emailed me back, don't bring any clothes, don't bring any books, don't yep. bring anything. You can get all that stuff here. Bring every camera and as much film as you can carry yep. because you can't turn a corner or turn around without there being something really amazing to, oh, to shoot. So I brought my Bolex. I brought a lot of 16 millimeter film. I had a contact still camera with some Zeiss lenses at the time, which I'm really glad I did because I have amazing slides that you know I shot and you know I just brought all the film I could in, into my suitcase and oh. cameras and and headed out. I mean that was my first trip. <laughs> After that experience with City of Ghosts, John, is there a moment? Is there a story? What was it for you where you knew Cambodia? I need to come back here. There's stories here that I want to tell. The way sort of Don't Think I've Forgotten happened, and a lot of people think that the Dengue Fever film was first, but in actuality, mm. I was already making Don't Think I've Forgotten and met Dengue Fever through making Don't Think I've Forgotten. And the opportunity to make Sleepwalking Through the Mekong happened in the middle of Don't Think I've Forgotten. You clearly somehow got a hold of my notes, John. It's becoming okay. increasingly <laughs> obvious. <laughs> so, no, but a lot of people do, you know, think that it's the other way around since Sleepwalking was finished so much right. um, earlier. But, you know, Sleepwalking was such an easy film to make. I yeah. We shot it in nine days. I cut it in two and a half months and it was done. It's sort of an experience or experiential film. Um, whereas Don't Think I've Forgotten is a historical and, yeah. you know, uncovering archives. And it became a much daunting, much more daunting task. But it was it was the first film, um, and I guess for me when I was there with Matt Dillon doing City of Ghosts, I read every book I could get my hands on about the history of Cambodia, and I started to hear the music a little bit here and there. And yeah. Matt talked about it; he had done some research and was really into it. And um, and I thought about making a film about the history and about the Khmer Rouge and America's involvement in the war and all the rest of it in King Sihanouk. But then I realized it had been done. It had been done mm. in the 80s by the BBC, by Australian TV, you know, various places. So I, I sort of put the, the idea to rest until I came back to New York. And um, I got Cambodia Rocks. A friend sent me that oh, compilation yeah. that a lot of people know that was 20 of the more sort of rocking songs from the 60s and early 70s. Um, but the person who had made the compilation, it was an American guy, didn't have any track listings, didn't know anything about anyone, even the song titles. It was just, you know, 20 unnamed songs with like the running time of the song and that was it. That's right? great, yeah. Um, so I had made a copy of it for a friend who was really into music who lived in Brooklyn and I gave it to him. And about a week later we were talking on the phone and I just said, hey, have you listened to that Cambodian CD I gave you? And he said, listen to it. I, I can't stop playing it. My girlfriend's ready to throw me out of the apartment. <laughs> And then he said the magic words to me. He said, this would make a great film. And then I was like, oh, man, that's it. Now I'm I done was, for. <laughs> well, you know, because it was like in the back of my mind still, like the Cambodian story yeah. in terms of the history. And I, you know, it's just a logical thing. I do a lot of music related stuff. And then when he said that, I yeah. just, it's just like the light bulb went on. I was like, you just hit on it. That That's it. You know, and here's little that I know that the next 15 years of my life were going to be. Or, or 10 years of my life were going to be so deeply tied to Cambodia and, and, and the story and the music, which I'm, you know, which is great. I mean, it's been a really amazing experience for me in, in every respect. Let's talk about the length in time that it took to complete a film like Don't Think I've Forgotten. And I ask about this. <laughs> Um, I ask about this because I think for my listeners, it might be good to hear from someone like yourself um, about what is that set length of time for a project? What decides how long or how short or, or how much time you're going to take to do a film? I, I, you know, the longer it took and as time went on, 
certain people would sort of be giving me a hard time just in terms of like, oh, no, none of my friends really wanted to hear about it anymore. Oh, you know, I know I, the feeling. <laughs> nobody wanted to even, you know, I only had a few close friends who would even look at cuts at a certain point, but that's fine. I mean, I, I remember Dengue Fever was playing here in New York, and I still was maybe two-thirds of the way through the film. It was about seven years in, and I went out with them afterwards to a bar, and it was late, and the bass player was giving me a hard time, like, oh, he's still working on that film, and he had a friend with him who was a, a composer, you know, a, a, for films, who, you know, she's like, oh, how long have you been working on your film? I said, oh, about seven and a half years. And she just looked at me and goes, that means it's going to be really good. Oh, wow. And that was like, <laughs> that was like, yeah, that's it. That's that's how it works. <laughs> you know? It's exactly it what I was thinking. <laughs> well, because if, you, if you're going to make a film, you know, in another culture, about another culture, yeah. for another culture, you know, you can't just drop in for a weekend and run around with a camera and come back and expect to do anything that's that's has any quality or understanding of that culture and to no, it. Oh, man. You couldn't relate more on on, on a prior project, the, the a film called Journey to Kathmandu that that I shot in Nepal, uh, a, a similar situation. And then even you know John with Elvis of Cambodia, with you know the film that Steph and I are doing now, it's you know we get asked all the time. We get asked, you know, have you done the film or is it finished yet? Is it finished yet? And already you can see some of the drop off in terms of the amount of people asking about the film and I can't tell if they're shy to ask you know did you did you do that film yet did you finish or are you still right. doing it or is that is right. that thing still happening or and so you know we know that there's no way that this film is gonna is going to see the light of day until you know probably the summer of 2017 and I'm preaching to the choir and talking to you about you know how much time it takes to do a project like this certainly one that's delving into an, an entirely other culture and so yeah yeah i get it and anybody who has seen don't think i've forgotten and if you haven't you certainly will after you've heard this podcast uh i can't encourage anyone enough um i can't rave highly enough about this film um i don't know if you remember john you know steph and i saw this you, there was a private screening that you gave yeah. a couple of years ago, right? In in sure. in, in Long Beach, or not in remember, Long Beach, but in L.A. Yeah, I remember you being, guys being there and talking to you, and then your reaction to the film. It was great. I was really glad you could be there, yeah. and it was really nice to you know to talk to you about it afterwards. I mean, you know, there's a couple things here. You know, dealing with another culture, but also dealing with their cultural history. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to make a film in Cambodia about you know, some guy who's got a, a, a Ciclo and he only rides it on Tuesday nights and you could probably do that pretty quickly. But if, <laughs> if you, I mean, maybe depending on where you go with it. Yeah, yeah, but, it totally. but, if, but if you're going to like get into the, the, you know, the cultural history of a country whose cultural history has essentially been erased, uh, well, you better, you know, plan on, on spending a little bit of time. This because, might take some, you might be yeah. in for the long haul. It's not, and it wasn't just finding the material, but it was also understanding it yeah. and understanding what it means to people there, and trying to tell it through their voice as much as possible. Right. I mean, that became sort of the, my approach was, you know, instead of having David Chandler talk about Cambodian history, <laughs> I'd rather have Penaras Saravut or Nordam Saravut, Prince Nordam Saravut, yeah. who is Cambodian and lived it and understands it well too, to tell it. Um, certainly, David Chandler had his place. Right. And there were certain things that he brought to the film that no one else really did or could. So, um, but anyway, I, I, I just really a big part of it became to me for me was just one step at a time. I mean, if you try and and, and conquer all your problems or solve everything or figure everything out all at once, you'll go crazy. You just have to really take one step at a time and just prioritize what the the most important thing is at the moment or the problem that you need to solve or the thing you're trying to get to and just focus on that if you try and do too much of it all at one time or look down the road when it's going to be done it doesn't it's not really helping you in any way let's talk a little about sleepwalking for the mekong i want to say sort of Real quickly, that this particular doc, John, I watched it really at a, at a great time in in sort of my documentary career. We were literally just starting 
um, initial filming for Elvis of Cambodia. At the time, it was meant to even be maybe a, a short film about Sinsi Samut. It's funny how that quickly changed. Mm. And and I was watching this film over and over. I re- in fact, I remember one particular evening, even setting up a small projector um up in uh, up in our backyard and projecting the film under the side of of our garage for a few oh, wow. yeah yeah for a few <laughs> musician friends who who really appreciate it and and there's something about you know the rawness of Cambodia that I feel like you captured in a very real um almost unintentionally unpolished but entirely pure way that for me exemplified uh really exemplified the Cambodia at least experiences that I had had um, oh, cool! For those for those who haven't seen it, John, tell us real real quickly about the film, and then tell us again how that came to be. Because as we know, it was a side project that you did in the middle, in the midst of working on the big um, project. Don't think I've forgotten. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, I was planning to come back to Cambodia to shoot the the real the chunk, the mother load of the interviews, and I had already sort of booked my ticket and. You know, it was a few months out from doing that when I got a phone call from Zach Holtzman, yep. who is the guitar player for Dengue Fever, which in Dengue Fever is, a, a, like you were saying, an L.A. based band who started out by playing the 60s Cambodian rock and roll note for note and then have evolved into sort of their own material very nicely. Um, and they have a Cambodian singer, um, Chomni Mole, who's an amazing, amazing talent. I mean, she, her voice is just, you know, it just makes the band be what the band is in so many ways. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so, I, you know, the, uh, Zach calls me to go. Yeah. Basically, Zach's line was like, and I had done a, vi- a couple of videos with them and I'd been to a lot of their shows and we, we were all very friendly and they had come out and spent time with me in Joshua Tree. And um, so I get a call from Zach saying, hey, our record label is saying that if you come to Cambodia with us and make a film about our first trip there as a band, mm-hmm then they'll put up the money to make it. That's like, so the, it's that's kind like of a fu- dream project for, for documentary and music geeks like you and I. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, like, oh, that's the call we wait for. Well, it's funny because without the film, they weren't going. Yeah. It basically, because we were going to create this product that the label could sell, oh. they would... They, because you know there's no money to be made in Cambodia for a band because it really <laughs> has any money to pay to see a band. Right. So all the concerts tend to be either free or very, very cheap. Yeah. So, um, but now... Dengue Fever has figured out other ways to get back over there, which I think is great. But so it just turned out that the window they had to go and make this film and be in Cambodia, I was going to already be there. I already was going to be there to shoot the majority of the interviews for Wonderful. Don't Think I've Forgotten. Okay, yeah. So it was a very productive time. I basically shot for two weeks on Don't Think I've Forgotten. The band showed up. I checked into their hotel, spent nine days running around with you know with them with the camera. Then they left, and then I went back to Don't Think I've Forgotten for another two weeks. <laughs> so, which was great. I had the same crew. I had the same gear. I kind of it was sort of all very seamless. But but I just want to say with Don't Think or yeah. with uh, Sleepwalking Through the Mekong, the great thing was the band came over very nervous. They had all these expectations. They weren't sure what was going to happen though, and how they'd be received by the Cambodian community and. Um, and they also didn't have very much plan. They were very just open to letting things happen. Yeah, they didn't bet. have any gigs even lined up. Yeah. Uh, Zach came over a few days ahead, yeah. and he and I got together, and all of this great stuff just sort of happened. You know, it's a very Cambodian thing where, <laughs> you know, if you try and force something or over plan something, it's you know it's not oh, going to happen. It's going to fail miserably. <laughs> yeah. So there's no point. And I think they had that sort of understanding already somehow, maybe from Nemo. I don't know, but. But um, all these great things just sort of unfolded, and I was just there with the camera, and it, it just kind of came together in a very organic way. And you know, like I say, it took nine days to shoot and two and a half to three months to edit, and it was done. One of my favorite scenes in the film was when you had Zach pull out his guitar and his small amp, and it was in the middle of, of one of the streets there in Phnom Penh. But I, th- I, I think it might have been close to the water, and and he just started playing and, and singing. I think it was an old Cincy Samut song. And mm. it, it, for me, it was absolutely amazing to watch the faces of Cambodians as they heard, you know, this Westerner, you know, singing and playing to one of their old songs. And of course, it's just this this longer take where you play it all out in real time. And the crowd just starts, it keeps getting slowly like bigger and bigger. And it's, you know, there's, there's this incredibly touching moment. And for my money, it, it's the kind of moments that are so precious and few and far between that, you know, 
I'm always striving for when I'm making documentaries. And of course, you know, you can never really tell when these moments are going to happen, right? Yeah, no, you have to be open to them. You know, and I guess I was so in that moment that um, I got very touched myself. I know. So, some, <laughs> someone actually pickpocketed me I know. while I was shooting that. And I had lost $300 in cash. So <laughs> you have to be careful when you're out there with the camera and you're alone. I mean, it was literally just Zach and I. We were just walking around. He had an amp. I had a camera. Yeah, yeah. So um, that was the only time that ever happened to me in Cambodia, well, though. You know what? We interviewed you know Zach for, for our film, and I asked him specifically about that scene. And he mentioned that there was a bit of irony to this you know, seemingly safe and pure moment that you guys had captured. And that was that you'd had your wallet stolen. <laughs> well, you know, it was during water festival and water festival no is way. a very big holiday. <laughs> and there's like literally hundreds of thousands of people who come to Phnom Penh from the countryside. And it's a very particular time for pickpockets to, oh, to have a, to do a little good business because there's so many people around. John, so yeah, I've been in and out of that country since 2004. Right. And I've only experienced what you've experienced one time the entire time also yeah. on the streets of Phnom Penh also during the water moon festival <laughs> yeah usually it's the other way around honestly I had so many times where something happened and I needed something and someone would come and help me yep. who I didn't know people just would walk up and be you know there's a there's, I'll tell you a really quick story yeah. I lost my cell phone in a sewer grating once I was sitting <laughs> On my motorcycle, and it dropped out of my helmet and went straight down, and it had all my contacts. In oh, Cambodia. I can guarantee it was retrieved. I guarantee it. <clears throat> yeah, they. Sh it's some the woman who was selling me the pomelo, the pomelo seller, the grapefruit seller. Yeah. She came and looked, and then she went and got her husband, and he came and looked. Then he came back with these two pieces of wood, like made chopsticks that were like six feet long, and he pulled it all the way up, but none of us could get our hand into the grating because our hands were too big. Then she ran off and came back with this little five-year-old kid who just put his hand in, and I still have the phone. Whereas, like, here, here, you know, that phone would have been long gone and nobody's going to come to help you get it. <laughs> Certainly not out of a sewer. You know, um, we may as well just, like, ditch the rest of this conversation and just use that. Like, if we're when we're talking about let's tell our audience what Cambodia is like, that's the story to tell them. Yeah, and, that, and that's why you keep going back. I mean, uh -huh. it's stories like that, you know. <laughs> I want to talk a bit about what it's like living and working abroad in developing countries, in particular with one's families. You and I both have had this experience, though I think that you guys may have been there a bit longer. Tell me how you and your wife, Linda, first came to the idea of, of living in Cambodia. And then um, how old your daughter was at the time and how long you guys were planning on staying? Well, I got to be honest, we've never really lived and worked in Cambodia. I've okay. I've been there 13 times, I think now. I'm starting to lose track. But I think, you know, it's usually for three or two months at a time. If you add up all the time, it it's comes out to like two years of actual time. But going there for two or three months at a clip has never presented any kind of a problem for us. Right, uh, right. I mean, first of all, Sotia... Um, she turned one in Phnom Penh. She started walking in Phnom Penh. And then we were back there again when she was three. Um, it's it's sort of easier for me, I have to say, because my wife is Cambodian. Right. And, um, you know, she has an extended family in Phnom Penh. And as you know, in Phnom Penh, children are everything and people <laughs> are there to help you um, because that's how they, they live. I mean, everyone takes care of the kids and um, there's always aunties and, and cousins or, or people that, you know, to sort of provide that for you much, much more so than here, certainly. Oh man, it's vastly different from here. Did, did Sotia spend a lot of time with family or when you were working, how did you, how, what was that arrangement like? Well, you know, Linda has an adopted family there that she's sort of taken care of. And now when we were there with Sotia, they came and helped take care of uh, Sotia okay. and, it's sort of this thing that, you know, Linda's also a visual artist and she's um, has a lot going on in Cambodia herself. So usually when we go there, we're both really busy. So, um, yeah, it's been it was great. I mean, obviously, it's so much cheaper to be in Phnom Penh and to get an apartment and a cook and all the rest of it for, you know, which we could never really afford so easily here. Right. Uh, right. Um, so, yeah, I, it's been it's always nice too just to sort of have your kid 
have those experiences and, and see the world through sort of a different lens. Uh, and, you know, we're going back, which I'm really excited about. I don't know if I told you this yet or not, but um, we're going back to tour the film, to tour Don't Think I've Forgotten, through all the provinces. Um, oh, some really far out places like Mandala Kiri or Atma Kiri. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So we're doing that through the U S government with their aid and we're actually going to have uh, a portable system. So the screen, the projector, we'll have a generator, a sound system. Yeah. So we could literally be projecting in a rice field to rice farmers like way out in the oh, boonies. Man, that's just um, the dream. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm so definitely going to be hitting you up at some point in the future. Yeah. About that, that. That's, that's happening mid December through mid January for a month. We're going to all the provinces, okay. and uh, and our daughter will be with us. So she's six now. Yeah. So I'm curious to see how that's going to go because she's older now and she can really, you know, start to understand things better and 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 be more influenced and connect to things. So I think when your kids are really really little, it really you know, obviously she doesn't even really remember being there now except looking at photos right. but but with going with kids to start to get older I, it's a, I think it's going to be a whole different experience certainly for them I think so too I know for Steph and I you know being there with Flynn who was 10 months old when we were there um, it was you know a lot of people of course here stateside and, and even her family's you know Steph's family's from the UK people thought that we were you know I mean, I don't think they thought we were crazy because that's 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 a thing that Chris would do or a thing that would stuff would do. But I, I'm sure that they were very wary and unsure of like, hey, it's one thing for you guys to be doing work in developing countries, or but you, but you're t- you're gonna take Flynn for however long you guys are gonna move to Cambodia. Like, how's that gonna work? Is that the smartest thing to do? And of course, we did. And I would just say that you know, Flynn now is nearly he's not quite two and a half we would be far more hesitant actually now to go with Flynn than we would have when he was 10 months because at 10 months he couldn't quite walk yet. And now of Mm. course he can run everywhere and and he would just easily, he could very easily get lost anywhere there. And, Mm. and it would be more of a concern safety wise. Now, you know, we were living up on uh, the fifth floor of an apartment and you know, it was fairly, the balconies were fairly closed off, but he couldn't even get to them. Now he could get to them and it's just all bets would, would be off. But we had a, we had a wonderful time with our, you know, 10 month old living in Cambodia. Child, child care worked out extremely well. I mean, it was, I mean, you talk about a second mom to, to, to Flynn. I mean, she was, she was that and, and more. So that was a lovely experience to have while we were filming there. Did you guys ever, did you guys ever consider living there? Actually we did. I, 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 yeah, we talked about, right. I was thinking about starting a production company and, um, (laughs) and go, but I I had sort of certain parameters that had to be met for me to, to move my family there and sort of stop my career here. Sure. Um, and we had an investor and the idea was to start a production company and come out of the gate with like the best camera, the best lenses. And, okay. you know, hopefully with my skill set, that would sort of put us in a certain position. Yeah, for sure. But, um, but that, you know, and also, you know, because Phnom Penh is so centrally located to, you have Ho Chi Minh City, you have Hanoi, you have Bangkok, you have Hong Kong is only a few hours away in Singapore mm-hmm. with that kind of, with those kind of tools, I could certainly see myself working just not only in Cambodia, but the region. Yeah. Um, but it didn't work out for a variety of reasons, and uh, we ended up in New York, where you know I'm from. So um, yeah, it's fine. But in the future, you know, I could see us perhaps moving there for a year and and doing certain things now. And um, my wife's a professor, and she'll have a sabbatical soon. And and if she's Cambodian, so yeah. it would make sense for us. And also, you know, our daughter now in school, I I could see working something out with the school and they're spending a year abroad. And I just think it would be so great for her. Oh, yeah. Certainly, Big certainly time. in a few years when she's really more, you know, aware of, of things. And I, I you know, I, I can't, for me to have that experience, for a kid to have that experience and to get away from our culture and see a completely different culture, I only think it can be positive. I don't, see any downside to it whatsoever (laughs) not at all i mean that's a big part of certainly i think what steph and i want to do with our children is to be able to to kind of immerse them in cultures so they can have these eye-opening experience and just see that hey there is a part of the world i mean there are so many parts to the world that exposing i mean it's just this is the way that that we think and sort of our choice but exposing them to these parts of the world like you like you have said can only 
can only be a good thing. And it's really great. And I, and, and I think a lot more people are doing that now. And I think getting back to making documentary films mm. and that idea of it, it being, able, being able to do that, um, and that's just sort of a bonus to the whole process, uh, is really great. So, um, But making it work financially, that's a whole other thing. And I think... You know, if you want to talk about really one of the harder things about making documentary film, it's just it's making a living and just having enough money to make the film itself because the process is so expensive. And, you know, when you get to the end and all of a sudden you have a sound mix and a color correct and all the rest of it, it doesn't get any cheaper. It gets even more expensive. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, that's one thing with Don't Think I Forgot. And I always like to tell people is that when we got to the end, I told my producing partner, Andrew Pope, I said, you know, make sure you hide some money because the sound mix oh. in documentary films always gets the short, you know, the short end of the totem pole because, or the low end of the totem pole because you're out of money. You've spent all your money making the film. You last thing you do is mix, and then you have like a day to mix or two days to mix. You know, I told Andrew, this is the the mix for this film is yeah. so important that I want I want two weeks at least, yeah. and um, that's what we did, and it really made a huge difference. I mean, the sound to the film is actually my favorite part of the film right now. It makes sense. It's it's it couldn't be more appropriate. I mean, your your music person, you a lot of the film work that you've done has revolved around your passion with music. The film itself is about music. I mean, it, it makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, and also we were dealing with such dodgy versions of certain songs <laughs> that you know, that's a whole nother conversation about oh. you know, the state of the music and where it's going and what can be done and and you know even the soundtrack you know we so much of it got mastered off of old vinyl which sure. is essentially is the new masters because all the master tapes of course have been lost right. or destroyed um and that part of the film I'm really I'm really proud of because it took a lot of work to find you know a lot of the music survived as you know mm. but it survived in really bad shape Forms, so yeah. the cool thing about don't think i've forgotten for me was i just started meeting all these people who yeah. were connected to the story or to the music and i started meeting a lot of collectors or collectors who knew other collectors yeah. who had original vinyl so you start to build this network of people who want the film to be good they care about the music they care about the culture and they start bringing things to it that you didn't expect and um, in some ways, the film starts to make itself, I mean, in an abstract kind of way. And that that's an amazing thing. A big credit has to also go to Dusted Digital, the label, who really believed in the project. Mm. And also the guy they used to master the record, his name is Michael Graves. Okay. And he's sort of maybe on the planet the best guy to go to. He has he's He's become an expert in taking old vinyl and he's got like a hundred different cartridges and amazing software. And he understands also not to clean out all the imperfections or all the hisses and, and scratches because he wants to maintain, you know, the analog quality and the warmth of the record. Right. Which um, so often that's a, gets met. It often gets lost. Yeah. And that's the balance. So he would be sending me back different versions of what he was mastering and maybe he'd go too far in cleaning it and then bring it back. And it was great to work with him. He's won a bunch of Grammys for doing this. I think he did a Hank Williams box set where there were wow. these old Hank Williams recordings from a radio show and they had found the tapes and they brought them to, to Mike Graves to, um, to master because he's the guy. And he won a Grammy for that, I know. So yeah, we were just, you know, just all the right people come into place and we were able to bring the music to a, to a quality, back to a quality that it was intended to be, which I never would have imagined no. we could have done that when I, I started know. this. You know, it just didn't seem like it would be possible. Yeah. So it, it's really, it's great. <laughs> As a good friend of mine always says to me, the film will tell you what it wants to be. Yeah. <laughs> you have the material that you have and you don't, you know, you don't have, you know, unless you go out and create more, the sort of film begins to take over at a certain point and that's that's always an interesting time in the edit room. Well, John, and I'm going to be, you know, I know that we're going to be relying on people like like you and 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 Linda to really sort of, you know, maybe to be seeing some early cuts and not and by, not to steer us in a direction, but certainly to be offering sort of that feedback 
um, and to keep us responsible, you know, and I'd, to you know, keep I'd, us on it. Chris, I'd, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And I always, for me, with feedback from people, it's like you take what makes sense and you leave behind what doesn't. And, totally. you know, so I, I'm, I'm totally happy to give you feedback. And I'm also happy if you don't listen to any of it. That's, yeah. I don't have a problem with that either. I think that's how it should be. You spent a chunk of time in that country. You are married to a Cambodian woman. You have a huge connection to that culture. And so as a colleague, I'm going to be relying on someone like yourself to be um, hopefully helping give give feedback that's going to help us either whether it's in the making of it or in the final the final film the final project. well I, just to, to sort of finish this out i'd be yeah. happy to and i think what we're getting at is the reason why we're doing this podcast is because it sort of does take everyone to help each other to sort of get through it and do the best work you can and certainly it's not a singular you know think that you can undertake on your own and think that you'll have all the answers and solve all the problems so um, I'm more than happy to, and a lot of people did the same for me to, in all the projects that I've done there. Right. So that's what it sort of takes to make it to do it the right way. I think what you just said there, it's at the heart of what I'm trying to do with the documentary life, and that's to offer some guidance, offer some bits of wisdom, and offer stories where I, hopefully people can avoid some pitfalls. Um, I want to inspire people. I want to have guests on like yourself who can who can inspire people, who can offer some wisdom, and 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 so that's it, man. It's all a big support group and that's really what i i want to foster um with this program i know for me um because i work commercially uh, one thing that i've noticed in sort of the commercial realm whether it's tv or features or specifically commercials here in portland at least i tend to we all tend to know one another and we kind of know what one another is working on and i feel like that's probably in part due to necessity. We need to know the coordinators. We need to know the, the producers because we need to get the work. And so there's a sort of a naturally organic networking that happens that way. I have not, I'm looking for that and, and, and maybe, and I know that for me, this show is probably an extension of that is finding that in documentaries. I'll give you an example. If somebody in Portland asks me, Chris, do you know so-and-so they work in, and if they work in commercial or features or TV, whatever it is, nine times out of 10, I know that person and, or I work with them regularly. Now, if somebody asks me here, Hey, my friend or so-and-so is doing a documentary film. It's about blah, 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 blah. Do you know he or she? It's the other way around. Nine times out of ten, I don't know who they're talking about, and I and mm. I try to figure out what. Why is that? What? Where is that? Like, is there a lack of networking that's happening in in documentaries? Or no. because, because I feel like we need it more than anybody. If anybody but needs I, to support in networking, it's the documentary filmmakers. But is it that is it possible that a lot of people are making documentaries who have never made films before or don't actively work in the film business? It's fairly simple to pick up a camera now and and to start shooting, which is great. Bite your tongue, my friend. Hand. It is not fairly simple. Well, I mean, <laughs> I didn't I didn't say it was fairly simple to make something that was really good. Yeah, no, and I to know. finish it, but to start a project and to right. say you're making a documentary. I mean, I've seen people, dude, who have no, no, never thought they'd make a film before, and just, you know, it's it's a way to get sort of enter the film business on your own terms and your own time, yeah. um, without having to really do much of anything beyond picking up a camera and starting to shoot. And I think um, again, this show is about empowering people to do that. Yeah, I mean. The one thing we really didn't talk about, which is one of the biggest, the hardest parts is just financing. And I know that, especially for documentaries, if you're not funded, if you're going to start a project, you better be prepared for it to take a long time and to be spending a lot of your time figuring out how to pay for it. Because, you know, it's kind of a drag, but obviously, you you know, that sort of take can take over the process. And, um, and I think a lot of people don't really think it through when they start and find themselves in that position and uh it's, that's the toughest nut to crack i think for most people were you there in the early stages of don't think i've forgotten were you doing that without a budget initially and then had to find your way into funds as you got further and further along yeah it's exactly what happened i had been shooting a lot of other people's documentaries and the whole process of lining up interviews and sitting down and lighting an interview and talking to people had sort of become part of my daily existence at that point so 
um, I got myself over to Cambodia with a really good camera and, and through, you know, meeting people there, started to line up interviews and shot a whole bunch of them and then came back here and realized it's going to cost $10,000 just to translate and, you know, subtitle all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like, who's going to pay for that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's again, it's sort of like, it's it's a tough one because if, unless you're fully funded, um, it's really difficult because as you start to make the film and you have this passion to make the film you start to incur all these costs that maybe you didn't think through and and you're sort of you're in between a rock and a hard place because if you started to make the film it's something you want to finish and you're really into it but you know it's costing you money that you don't have and you get to that point you start to think well what do i do now oh uh, yeah <laughs> so do i just let this thing go is this something that's always going to be a part of yeah, I never really got around to finishing that. And, and that's a terrible feeling. And that happens to how many? That happens to a lot of filmmakers, right? You you get this thing filmed and then what to do afterwards because you don't have the time because you don't have the money and you can't pay yourself to do it and you don't have the funds to get the mix done or to even like get an editor to begin with or get the translation work, you know, done. Yeah, I, I don't think any statistics on this is, have been put together, but I would, if I had to venture a guess, I would, be, it would be in the high 90s or at least in 90 percentile you know of, of projects that don't get finished that get started i don't mean to scare anyone saying yep. people start making these films and they never finish them it's really i think what you tend to do is you, it forces you to be more creative and figure out a way to tell your story that um that you know you've really had to think through more because you don't have you know, unlimited budgets. And that's actually a good thing. And it's a good exercise. It is. It is. One of the things that we have to do with our film is, is, I mean, you know, yourself, you've, you've delved into the history of Cambodian rock and roll. You've delved into the history um, of Cambodia and there just isn't, you know, the amount, like nobody, I, I, I would think it's safe to say nobody will ever find the amount of a material that you have. And, and I know that we would never, we're not trying to do that. But you yourself know, if you're doing a film that deals with somebody like Sinsi Samut, you yourself know how the lack the lack of archival footage and photo, photographs that are out there. So we have had to get extremely creative. So I yeah. couldn't agree more. And, 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 and initially, you know, I never shied away from that. As you know, as storytellers that we are, it opens up other creative avenues and those can be some of the best parts of films that we see. Yeah, no, exactly. Sometimes like all the things you thought were your biggest problems turn out to be like the, your biggest attributes. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it may sound it's sort of almost hard to explain, but I th hopefully people get, you know, get the concept that you may face a really daunting challenge, but because you pour so much energy into solving it, it becomes something else. Uh, that you really didn't foresee. You have to do the work. It really just comes down to can, having the passion to wanting to, to tell the story you're telling and to put in the time and the effort. And I'll be honest, there were times in the editing room where I thought I was out of my mind oh. and like, am I out of my crazy? Like, is this ever going to all hang together? And, you know, eventually you get there, but, um, you know, you have to sort of find a way to recharge your batteries and, and uh, sometimes you even have to step back and put it down and come back to it. But that's just, you know, that's just the nature. And you now for me, one of the things, and I think it's probably the same for you, is that I knew I had really great music to work with. And if you're coming from that as your starting point, then you're in a pretty good place. Yeah. John, thank you so much for the conversation today. Yeah, Chris, I was really, really happy to talk to you. And uh, hopefully we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, that would be lovely. Thank you so much. Hey, it's me again, Chris. I want to just take a moment to thank you for listening to The Documentary Life. And I know that you get this, but I really think it bears repeating. Without you, this podcast doesn't exist. So if you like what you're hearing with The Documentary Life, I'd like to ask you for a little help. And there are two ways in which you can do this. They're super easy, but it'll go a long way in helping out the future of this podcast. One, I'd like to hear from you. I want you to share with me some of your experiences and insight into this world of documentary filmmaking. We all have our own stories and wisdom, and we need to share them with one another. So I'd like to encourage you to email me at chris at barongfilms.com. That's chris, C-H-R-I-S, at barongfilms.com, B-A-R-A-N-G, films.com, and share some of your stories, insight, and inspiration. 
and then I'd love to be able to share some of this with the listeners of the program. I mean, wouldn't it be really cool to start a bit of a support group through this podcast? Again, that email, chris at barongfilms.com. Now, the other way that you can help me out significantly is by giving this show a five-star rating and writing a quick review over at iTunes. And while there, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the podcast and or downloading the episodes. I know that everyone says this, but it truly is the most effective way to get the show seen and heard by more people that visit iTunes, especially over the course of the next few weeks, where we're vying to get into what's known as iTunes' new and noteworthy section. It's through the ratings, subscriptions, and downloads that we stand a good chance at getting into the new and noteworthy section. Why is it important to get highlighted here? More visibility for the show, which means more listeners, which means more downloads, you get the snowball effect here. So please, if you like what you're hearing with The Documentary Life, consider heading over to iTunes and giving the show a five-star rating, writing a review, and subscribing to the podcast. In advance, thank you for helping me out with this. As you know, I'm pretty new to this podcast thing, so any and all support is massively appreciated. Till next time, I remain your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. So long, thanks for listening, and keep on living your documentary life. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.